is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Unspoiled, the book club covering Children of Blood and Bone by Tommy Adeyemi. In this book, man, this is, uh, this story is a lot. And I have to say that the ending caught me quite by surprise, and I was pretty impressed that she was willing to go that hard. Welcome to Unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. I am Candice. And yeah, this, um, so I want to, you know, acknowledge that I always try for the, uh, February book club, since February is Black History Month, to choose a black author. And this book was recommended, um, by a lot of people in the group and got voted up quite a bit. So, uh, that is, that's part of why I always, I put this book in February at the beginning of this year. And you hadn't read this. Had you heard anything about it, Candace? <laughs> if I heard anything about this extremely popular young adult high fantasy novel, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I have heard a lot about this book, but I still didn't know anything about it going into it. You also like tend to have your finger on the Twitter pulse, like regarding Twitter fights between authors and stuff. And there was a bit of a, um, a, what's the word I want to say? A kerfuffle. Kerfuffle. That's excellent. Yes. A kerfuffle. Uh, because Nora Roberts came out with a book that was just called Of Blood and Bone. This is incredibly stupid. <laughs> and to be honest, I, I really wish that this whole thing hadn't happened at all mm -hmm. because I feel like it kind of, uh, it made the author of children of blood and bone look like a dick mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, Nora Roberts isn't even on social media. Like her assistant handed this woman has written like 50 gajillion books. She admittedly lives under a rock. Yeah. And the title of this, and I don't think this is me being, um, you know, dismissive at all. But the title of this book is not what's special about it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing special about the title Children of Blood and Bone at all. The Blood and Bone, Smoke and Ash, House of House of Leaves. I was like, wait was a out. second, we veered somewhere here. But, <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot of books that are blank of blank mm -hmm. and blank. You know, this is not I honestly have no idea why she chose to march up this hill and put a flag on it, but it was definitely a mistake. And I felt like her apology was ridiculous, but her fans took it to a really weird level. Mm -hmm. um, this woman and Nora Roberts do not even write in the same genre. Yeah. And like, even if you look up different book titles, there are, a lot of examples of really famous writers naming their books almost the same thing as another very famous writer. Um, so I can understand, I mean, let's be honest, the history of white people taking things from people of color is very real. And I can understand the impulse to immediately be like, are you serious? But uh, Nora that Roberts apparently true. submitted her manuscript like a year before this book even came out. And had chosen anybody the title already. Anybody been through publishing, and Adeyemi should know this because she's had her book traditionally published. This is a Pitch Wars book. Do you know what Pitch Wars is? No. Pitch Wars is a thing that exists on Twitter. I don't know if it's annually or what because I find it extremely stressful <laughs> um, in the same way that I find um, NaNoWriMo extremely mm. stressful so i don't follow this but i know what pitch wars is because i have friends who have participated but it's like <clears throat> there's a hashtag and writers will submit a pitch 
um, in some tweets. And the point is to hook new authors up with agents representation. Um, and she, she won. This is, uh, it's, it's a pitch wars book. And I think cool. that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, good for her, but she's now been through the traditional publishing process. She had a poster in, was it Times Square or something? It was fucking huge. Like this book was very big deal. Mm -hmm. She should know that an author like Nora Roberts probably has years worth of shit in the queue. Yeah. You know, the publishing process is years long. This bitch didn't steal your title. She doesn't know who you are. She probably has five other books that sound like the same thing. <laughs> This is ridiculous to me. So I thought the whole, and some of her fans were being exceptionally volatile. That's the most main of them thing. were white women. And I want to point that out, that most of these women were white women. They were like, does she live under a rock? Yes, <laughs> she does literally live under a rock. So I don't want to go on about this, but the whole thing was just stupid. Yeah, I um, I just wanted to acknowledge that because it was something that got brought up in the group when this book was selected. and. Uh, I know that it disappointed a lot of people the way that she handled it. And she didn't delete the original tweet accusing Roberts for like months it's, after and finally did. Yeah. But it was like the damage had really been done and she did not backtrack enough or apologize enough in a lot of people's eyes. And um, I feel like she probably thought that she did, which honestly, this whole thing reeks of, I mean, her publisher probably is the one who, they should have asked her to remove that tweet a lot sooner. Yeah. But this reeks to me of one of those situations where a woman does something and then her friends are in her ear saying, you know what though? It's not really that bad. That bitch has 500 books. Who cares? You know, it just encouraging this catty stuff. I don't know. I just felt like it was really passive aggressive. And for a woman who knows enough to participate in pitch wars, she should have known better. I, I'm hoping that she, yeah, kind of, because I think it, if this was, this was her first book you were saying, right? Like her first published novel. Yes. I read a biography of her this morning. Mm -hmm. She wrote, she's been writing for a very um, long time, but uh, nothing complete. Um, so I can understand if you are somebody who has only recently started to get an enormous following, you may not appreciate the full impact of essentially like sicking fans on social media on somebody. Um, at this point, honestly, dude, at this point and where we are in social media and how public personalities behave, if you're going to be, on social media, you need to be aware of this. I, I agree. You need to be, but I don't think that means that it's something that people like by osmosis managed to figure out, you know, this happened to somebody who maybe was not used to wielding this kind of influence. And I can a hundred percent see like when I first started podcasting, I would like disagree with the take on another show and call them out by name. When I mentioned how much I disagreed with them on my show and that's not something I would ever do now. But at the time I did it, I honestly didn't think that anybody was like paying attention or would care. And it was, it just didn't, I didn't understand how I was occupying that same space. Now I'm not, I wasn't just like some random like blogger or something. I was another, I was in the same pool as them and there's just a certain kind of respect that you have to have that I didn't have. Um, so there are anyway, who are internationally best-selling authors who still behave like toddlers on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And yes, I'm talking about Cassandra Clare. <laughs> I do not know who that is. She has had me blocked on Twitter since 2010. Ooh. Yeah. Um, she's, She's, she weaponizes her fan base. I don't respect it. And I really hope that this woman, um, I hope that Ariyemi learns from this situation. Mm -hmm. If she ever writes another book, I hope she doesn't do this. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like there's um, a sequel in the works from the uh, afterward on this book. And 
I hope so because I didn't care for the ending. To be honest. The ending was well, well. All right, let's let's get into the plot of this book then. Now that we've talked about this, and I um I want to give a thank you to I believe it was Sue Hayes who sent me this book as part of the um the unspoiled Yuletide book swap. Um, that's something that patrons have access to this group on Facebook, and uh, around Christmas time we all get together and like figure out thanks to Megan Walsh who like does most of the heavy lifting on this. Um, we take a quiz and figure out exactly what kinds of books the others enjoy. And she sent this to me before she knew that I'd selected it for the book club for this year. So it just turned out to be excellent timing. Um, so I got like the hardcover special edition that comes with this like big fold out map inside oh, i would have loved some help with that <laughs> which is like really cool looking um and what on the back is all the clans um this is let's see we've got oh this is lagos so this oh, is okay. just like the marketplace and everything which uh lagos doesn't wind up playing a huge role because they wind up uh there for like one small portion and they're traveling the rest of the time and then there's the map in the beginning of the the like hardcover as well of the whole country. Nice. Um, I always appreciate maps and fantasy books, especially in a book like this, where they're that really plays a part in because they're being chased versus just like you know, uh, for example, The Hobbit when they are ambling along. Um, <laughs> so the story is set in. A land called Orisha, and um, the the history of this land is that there is a group of people called Magi who have magical powers that are linked to different gods, and there is a king who is um, he is a tyrant basically because his family was murdered by magi and he decides this means magic in general is evil and out of control and he decides I want to that- point out okay it wasn't just i mean his entire family like i know he's a villain but i think it's really important to note that his father um suffered a lot mhm even as he was attempting to make peace, his whole he had a whole other family. Like King Saran had like a whole other family. Mm-hmm. He had a wife and a son, and they were murdered. Super ugly. His father so, and mother as well, weren't they? Yeah, like yeah. So this guy's like hatred is. <laughs> I mean, it's not completely just wildly off base. His personal life experience dictates. That magic is dangerous. He takes it to an unfortunate genocidal level. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I so I, let me let me finish with the overview okay. because he wants to get rid of magi entirely, and he found a stone that can be used to make chains that suppress powers. So he invades all of these different communities using the chains to capture and kill um, magi because they can't fight back with anything but their magic. They don't have like the physical strength. What's that? This is extremely violent. Yes. The the description of the chains, Mm -hmm. um, they they don't just, they're not just like suppressing your magic. They're actively harming you. It's like, um, on True Blood, when vampires are yes. covered with silver, it's like burning. I was thinking of that exact thing. And it especially yeah. kicks in if you try and tap into your power while you're wearing it. It will it will like sizzle and make it worse. So he it's figures really this gross. out, which is something that they had not had before, and it renders them essentially completely powerless and easier to kill. And he kills many, enslaves the rest, and they are essentially like bottom class citizens. I was going to say second class, but that's not even adequate. He leaves everybody under the age of 13 alive. Right. Which is, is, is somehow painted as, 
I think it's Anand who's describing his feelings on it in chapter eight or something. And he's, Mm -hmm. he views it as a little bit of a mercy, but he's really kind of disgusted by this whole thing. Yeah. Um, But uh, he does leave everybody under the age of 13 because those people don't have access to their powers yet. Right. Right. So the story begins with a young girl named Zelly and it's written in first person present. This was tough, man. Yeah, you have you weren't a big fan of this. I actually no. it didn't register for me that it was first person present when I started reading it until you mentioned it to me later. I was prepared to be okay with it um cuz I I got the library book. Um it's really big. Um and then I ended up getting the audio book mm-hmm. because I I'm not good at guessing at pronunciations. Uh, I pronunciation. You can't even pronounce pronunciations. Is that not how you say it? No. Don't correct me. Don't correct me. I don't want to learn. I will never improve. I will never change. Oh my playing. god! I will say it how I want. You say Pinterest stupid too. So don't listen. Me. You don't no, have a leg to not. stand on when you just mispronounced <laughs> pronunciation. I said pronunciation. Is that wrong? That's wrong. It's pronunciation. Anyway, <laughs> so I got the audio book so that I could hear this lady say the names the way they're meant to be said. Okay. Tell me. And, um, but uh, I, God damn it. I lost my whole train of thought because you decided to harass me about <laughs> my pronunciation. <laughs> God damn it. Zelly? Is it Zelly? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go on. It just we're in the beginning. Is it Zelly? Oh, the is first that person, you... the first, yeah, it is. It's Zelly. Okay. Um, but I was gonna say the first person, um it bothered me more in the the physical book than it did in the audio book. Okay. Because the narrator, she's very good. Um <clears throat> But uh, I, I didn't care for the first person because there were POV shifts, which I was not expecting. Right. And that takes me out of it so hard. Like, I can handle POV shifts when it's in, like, third person. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first person, um, I had a real hard time going from Zelly to, um, I, I thought, um, uh, the princess. Amari. Amari. I, uh, but going from those two to a non was very hard for me. Yeah, I could see that. Uh, but I enjoyed the opening. I thought it was really good. So, yeah. Zelly, what happens, um, to cut a long story short, we get, like, to see how the guards who work for the king harass everybody who is, uh, has white hair, which is a, like, trademark of somebody who would be a magi. And this is a lot of really good world building. In this yes. Movie. And the white hair is the, the only thing because why I say would have magic. Something was done to cut off the Magi from their magic and they cannot do anything anymore. So all they've got is the white hair, which is enough for them to be treated horrifically, even though they don't have any magic there's they're not doing any harm to anyone they're not practicing anything but it doesn't matter they are what they are and that makes them something to be feared doesn't even work here because there's nothing to fear they're just somebody to beat up on and mock and humiliate this is even later debunked um we realize that the white hair is not necessarily indicative oh that's right i forgot about this uh, the teacher. Anyway, uh, that's jumping ahead. I super like the teacher. Yeah. I love her. Yeah, she she's great. great. Mama Agba. Uh, she, yeah. She, I, this whole scene at the very beginning with the staff fight and the way that it's described and like the rattling of the walls of this building mm-hmm. that they're in. And <clears throat> I, it was really engaging in a way that I didn't expect from a first person fight mm-hmm. because writing fights is really difficult to begin with. Yeah, it is. Um, that choreography is hard. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed this scene and I just, I felt I, I could see like all of the different layers of like, uh, 
gosh, I can't even remember her name. The girl she was fighting in the very first scene. Oh, um, here, I got it open here. Yemi. Yemi. She is being real ugly to Zelia. Yeah. Or Zelly. Zelly. I'm sorry. I'm really bad with names. Um, she's really ugly to her and she calls her a maggot, which is like a, it's a slur that I guess everybody uses against Magi. Mm -hmm. Um, She's really ugly to her, and yet she's been cast out of her own her home area because she's the bastard daughter mm-hmm. of a lord. And the only thing that makes her better than Zelly is that her skin is like a fraction of a shade lighter. Mm-hmm. She's literally been kicked out for being the illegitimate daughter of some important dude, and she's still going to be a bitch. Yeah. You know, like, it's just, that's so real. Like, I don't even think that that needs to be in the context of this book to be relatable. It's, it's the classic, I will cling to whatever I can to feel like I'm better than you scenario. Yeah, even if it's just a little bit better, mm-hmm. a tiny bit better. That is something that I can't even control myself. My skin happens to be a little bit lighter than yours. Mm-hmm. And I am the physical reminder that my father was a shit bag, but hey, I'm a little lighter than you and I did nothing to earn it, but I'm still going to be a bitch about it. Yeah. I feel like it's really interesting because the, the afterword of this book talks about um, her inspiration in writing this being uh, derived from the pain of all of the black people who have been gunned down by police and how, little anyone really seems to care. And because of this story being a, a story of an oppressed people getting their power and rising up, the fact that there are no white people whatsoever in the story is a really interesting choice. It's just different shades of black skin. And, we have like one character later, a pirate who I believe is like coded as Asian. Um, and that's like the only race other than, than basically African because we have, you know, different foods and, um, Yoruba is being spoken like it's an ancient language. Um, that I found that really interesting that she was telling a story that she was digging into a white supremacist, um, like a a struggle in history, but wrote it without any white folks at all, which I feel like has to be purposeful to keep white people from being, from like taking any sort of center stage in the story. Well, what she's done is she talks about it later in um, Samara's first chapter. Amari. Oh fuck. The princess. Amari. Yeah. Amari. Um, than her mother would like. Right. And her mother compares, she says something like, she compares her to people who work in farms. Right. And she's been spending so much time outside, she looks like a farmhand. Which <clears throat> doesn't mention white people, but, you know, that kind of thing still exists in countries where, you know, colonized countries and countries where there's different shades of, of brown skin. Mm-hmm. It happens in India. You know, it's this is they judge the darkness of your skin by how important you might be. If you have mm-hmm. too much of a tan or whatever, well, I guess you spent too much time outside. Yeah, this is um a big deal in like um I was just actually reading a post from Love Life of an Asian guy on Facebook where he was talking about how people will shout that like in Asia it's not due to colonization that prizing pale skin happened before white people ever came to their shores. And he's like, whether or not you prize paler skin because of colonization or not, you're still setting a standard that this is preferable and better. And that these other people who do not have that are inherently going to be like less worthy citizens. And it amounts to the same thing. It doesn't matter whether or not it's due to colonization. Yeah. It doesn't matter where it came from. And as, you know, as she proved in this book, you know, there doesn't necessarily need to be any even hints of colonization for this kind of thing to be believable. Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk about Amari real quick because, um, you know, we have Zelly. She's learning in a secret, like, fight club, basically, in her village <laughs> how to fight I with staff. I didn't realize this was a secret. I didn't realize it was a secret at first. I thought, well, this is just what they do. But no, right. no, nope, totally secret. They got to pretend to be seamstresses or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um but they're doing this in secret and it just made me love the teacher even more. And I love too, that when they're trying to hide what they're doing from the guards, they bring out all of these dummies and stuff that have like dashikis that they've been working on for years, the same ones <laughs> because they've notices. never, yeah, nobody ever notices, which I just find really oh, funny. Men are so dumb. Um, Universally and men are, and I really also, um, I loved how this wasn't just like a story about, <sighs> you know, oppression based on, you know, skin tone or where you're from or what you do for a living. Those guards were hella rapey with Zelly. That was so gross. Yeah. And she straight up said it in the book too. She said, there will always be men who are going to try to take advantage of you. I'm like, you're reaching for all the dots lady. And I appreciate it. Yeah. This is um honestly pretty like, because, you know, I am also reading the fifth season by N.K. Jemison for Spoil Me. And it's another similar, like, fantasy, uh, like, huge scope fantasy setting um, that's a sort of an allegory for oppression of Black people. And that is meant for adults. That is not a YA series. And this is YA, but it goes pretty intensely, like up front with talking about rape torture um you know this makes a lot more sense or it made a lot more sense um after i read her her um a page i i went to a a website called lit charts because i don't trust my own analysis a lot of times and i don't want to sound stupid which i've already done but I read a bunch of stuff about the author, and she's an anime fan. Yeah. And if you're familiar with how really long, spanning anime that lasts like 400 plus episodes, the way that she's done the story with all of like the smaller arcs and the bigger arcs and the bigger themes, well, this is very typical of long running shonen anime. And <clears throat> these things are meant for children, but they never shy away from these really super like intense topics Mm -hmm. they just do it in a way a smaller bite-sized way that children can Mm -hmm. pick up on like genocide and murder and rape and uh you know how we treat other people who maybe have a background that we find less palatable and you know orphans and betrayal and all of this kind of stuff um it's really common it really kind of just helped me understand the way the book is structured that's interesting um so yeah, Zelly's dealing with with these guards that harass them, that are levying more taxes on them that they can't pay, and she f- is able to catch this incredible sailfish that will get her a fortune if she brings it to Lagos, which is the main. There's nobody in their village who can pay what this is worth, so she's going to bring it to Lagos, which is a huge city area with a thriving marketplace. And uh, this isn't a decision that she just randomly made either. Um, her dad is being right. threatened. Baba. She feels a lot mm-hmm. of guilt because of her identity and who she is and her family is suffering simply because she right. exists. Yes. Um, and I should add this, one of my that favorite- this book starts with her getting mouthy with a guard when she really needs to not talk and she can't keep it inside. And girl. it leads to like, basically mama Agba has to pay a bunch of extra taxes in order to keep them from like torching the place. And it's, it's the first of several instances in which Zelly makes choices that have repercussions for her brother, Zane, who ends up getting really sick and tired of dealing with the bullshit. He feels that she brings on both of them. That's valid to me. Like it's one of the things that I appreciated most in this book was the utter lack of like fate and destiny. Zelly is allowed to make her own choices. Sometimes they're not good. Yes. And people suffer because of them. Those are those are stakes that she cares mm-hmm. about. 
you know, cause so often people just don't have to work for their, you know, for the, the thing, they just get everything handed to them because there's no stakes and they never really have to make any true sacrifices. Right. Um, and I really feel like the stakes that were established in this book um, were a lot more meaningful than what I would consider to be like a peer of this book. And um, I just, <clears throat> I thought that that was really well done. Yeah, I agree. She did it better. She just, she did it better than other people writing in this very same genre. So Amari is the princess who is living in Lagos in the palace with her mother and father, um, King Saran, Saran. I always want to say Saran, like Saran rap. Yeah, I think it's Saran though. Um, And, and we get a tiny little like look into a life that she leads that is just so incredibly repressed. She is not allowed to eat how, as much as she wants to eat. She is not allowed to dress any way other than exactly what her mother recommends. And she has to be very aware of how she looks and take care of her complexion because she's too dark. So they have to have servants follow her outside with umbrellas and shades and everything. If she ever wants to like step foot in the garden and she has a close friend, Binta, who is her friend in her eyes, but Binta's a slave. Yeah, Binta has been taken from her family and her village, and she's been, she's her companion. Mm-hmm. I also, like, when I was reading this, I also just kind of assumed that Binta was, or could have possibly been, in this context, a whipping girl. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, uh, the princess ever did anything naughty right. or whatever, like Binta would be the one to take those punishments. Not that, not that she would ever, you know, she's not like Joffrey, you know, where she's doing bad shit on right. purpose just so she can watch her whipping counterpart get beat right. to hell. But I just kind of assumed that that was part of it. And it's sort of like there's a scene later where it is Amari who fucks up and Binta simply volunteers herself and claims that it was her own idea, what they were doing, which I felt like, um, what, what I think the author was trying to do there was, was turn it into, she was a whipping girl, but it wasn't like Amari knew that and saw like it wasn't a literal thing that happened because she didn't want Amari to be someone who lived that way and didn't seem to see what was wrong with it. Do you get what I mean? I feel like she was trying to really yeah, straddle a line there. And so she didn't have it. I think that, I think that Binta cared about mm-hmm. Amari. I think that she genuinely loves her, but only in the context that she doesn't have right. a choice. And I think that um, also, even as, you know, uh, Amari is suffering all of this, like, stress in these scenes where she's, you know, witnessing what's happening to Binta mm-hmm. here. Her her fantasy of what she wants to be happening instead is basically Binta serving mm-hmm. her. She wants to be taken back to her room. She wants tea. She wants little cakes or whatever. You know, she's... She can't help She doesn't like, understand she doesn't a relationship with Binta yeah. outside of the context of her being her servant. Yeah. Right. And that's so it is. That was so, that's what it is. And I, I don't, you know, I don't want to like, you know, I'm sure that, you know, Binta really did love her, but again, only in the context of what she's allowed to do. And that's just so Which, sad. I mean, if it rings really true as you can't write, you know, if you were going to write a, um, a care a white woman character with a slave that she has like befriended in the United States, you can't have her imagining the two of them going out like for tea together because that's literally not something that would ever be allowed by anyone anywhere. Like that's not on her social, that's not part of her understanding of the world. So I guess it makes sense that, Amari, it doesn't like, there is a part of her as much as she doesn't understand the level of oppression that Binta suffers. She doesn't really get it. She still knows enough deep in her heart 
that this is how it's going to be to such an extent that she can't imagine anything outside of those boundaries, which is really like just says so much about where she is in her mind. She can't change any of these Mm -hmm. things. She's just, she's, she's a token, you know, she, she's got to be pretty so that she can get married. She's constantly being compared to her brother's fiance who her mother adores. You know, why can't you be lighter skin like Samara? Why can't you dress like Samara? Why can't you wear all of this shit on your hands and everything like Samara does? And then her mom does this in the most condescending, stupid way. Like, I just, I felt sorry for her. But in my opinion, um, Amari is like, she's a liability throughout most of this book. And I felt Zelly's frustration every single time. She was like, God damn it, I just want to push this bitch in the water. And yeah, away. I have to agree there. <laughs> like, I wound up really liking Amari as time went on. But yeah, definitely I, initially. I, I, she got a real Yeah. She got a real solid um she got real solid their development. She got to stab her dad and all that good stuff. Did not <laughs> see that coming, yeah. I have to admit. Oh come on. Nope. I figured that Zelly was going to have the showdown with him. I did not think it was going to be Amari. I thought that Amari was going to have to have a psychological showdown where she defied him finally, but I never thought there was going to be a fucking like sword fight between the two of them. I love oh, yeah, that. Same. I love that she's still trying to like work all this shit out in her head. And then she sees her dad, like stab her brother. And she's like, Nope, we're done here. <sighs> and she doesn't, all right. I, I thought she had a really good arc, but honestly, she was a huge liability throughout most of the story. And I just like Zelly. I just wanted to be like, just, can we just and that's her? such a great analogy because for me, Amari is the stand-in for a white woman, or at least a very light-skinned black woman, in terms of like she's the role she's role. somebody who's not who eventually she gets it, but it takes such a long time, and along the way, you want to drown her, you know. And like I had a um a friendship with a black woman uh, that. I wound up like unfriending her on Facebook because I was just, there was like a lot of friction between us and I couldn't understand why she seemed to be like passive aggressively posting in like sort of quotes, things that I had said, like paraphrasing and obviously being very irritated by it. And I was like, if you have a problem, can't we talk about it? And I approached her a couple times trying to like get her to, to open up to the fact that she clearly was angry at me in some way. And she would not talk with me about it. And I finally was so stressed by it that I unfriended her because I was just like, I, you clearly don't like me. So I don't know why we're friends if you don't want to talk about this with me either. And I look back now and I realize I was a tiresome white woman who did not get it. <laughs> and she did not feel like explaining it to me, which I look at I'm like, I respect that. I get it now. Like I must have been so infuriating because I was falling right in that irritating place where it's like, you understand that racism is bad, but you don't understand the levels of it and the the nuances of it. And you're still willing to defend trash people, or you're still willing to make excuses for things that you don't understand and just stop. And that I think is where Amari is, is that, you know, she starts off just basically being like, well, my friend Binta and, Binta's her stand-in for this entire segment of the population, and that's the only context she has. And it's not entirely her it's fault, not, but it's still really exhausting. exactly. And that's where I think I was it's for this woman tight. was just like I what she knows I wasn't a bad person, but I was really <laughs> tiring, and she just couldn't <laughs> fucking do it anymore. And I probably did her a favor by unfriending her because she was just like, I'm not going to do that. But then by once I was gone, she was like, Oh, thank God. Honestly, you know, I think was really what happened. (laughs) So, and, and I hold no ill will towards her about that at all. And that's, I feel for Amari because she is in a place at the start of this book that I was in like five years ago with my understanding of social issues and just really like, I, I wanted the best and I wanted to do well 
if people were too harsh about something or if they accused someone of something and I didn't understand the history behind what they were saying, I would be like, well, that seems a little much. Like, do we really need to jump down people's throats like this here? I feel like you're alienating your allies kind of thing. <sighs> she starts to get it. She finally, like, towards the end of the book, like, really is a confidant for Zelly. But at first, Zelly would love to just kill her. Like, especially. She thinks oh, about yeah, it more than a couple once. times. And Zelly's, uh, what, what, the way that they wind up pairing up is, Amari, Binta gets called away while Amari's at a banquet. And Amari has a sudden realization that she gave Binta a gift. Um, and I think that she's worried that Binta's going to get in trouble if somebody sees it and doesn't understand that it was a present. They'll think she stole it. Right? Yeah, her, I, I felt like this was a little bit a little bit forced to me. Like, I know that the point was for her to eventually get to where her dad and, and the guards mm -hmm. are and where Ben, like, I know that this is supposed to be like the catalyst right. to where she goes and gets to witness Benta being murdered. But the whole reasoning behind it was like, Oh girl, really? Like this is, this is what you're doing. Like, I don't know. I'm just, it was just, it just felt a little weak to me. But once she got there, I forgot about it because that whole thing was just super terrible. Yeah. So she follows Binta, who's been called to the throne room, which is always bad news. And she knows it. So like. One of the, one of the things that really stuck out to me, though, about this particular mm -hmm. scene is that Amari has a hiding place. She already has this. She knows where to go. Oh, so she that she can see. And yeah. Move. Yeah, so this is not the first time that she's yeah. done this. Um, and I think later in the book, it kind of made me a little bit more irritated with her because the fact that she has this implies that she's seen other shit her father's shit done before. Yeah. And she's still just insufferable which is such another great because how many white people have no sympathy for people of color until it's one of their people of color that they like you know like right your boss, that whole right. fucking story about everybody who wanted to build the wall but when it turned out that their favorite mexican chef from their town was going to be deported they were all up in arms right. to protect this guy all of a sudden like and, and again it doesn't get much more of a perfect like point for point allegory than that, because he's a chef who's do, like doing a service for them. And that's what they value. You know, like this is just right. <laughs> like I'm reading this and it's a high fantasy setting with literally magic. And it's just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so Amari <laughs> sees um, Binta brought into the throne room. There's this weird little scroll that they have her touch when she does, light explodes from her hands, and they immediately kill her. Stick her through with a sword. This this thing where uh, she recalls her dad always telling her that magic is terrifying and mm -hmm. ugly. You know, that this is undesirable. She thinks that it looks pretty. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, like, fuels her... It just felt a little bit like shallow on her part, but again, this like who's who mm -hmm. she is. Like this is pretty. Oh, you know you're, you know you're you're not fat. You're beautiful. You know it just felt it felt a little bit like that. You know, like I think your dark skin is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Looks like a chocolate bar. Oh God! <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know people do that kind of stuff, and that's what it felt like to me. But I just honestly. It, I was willing to take it at face value because the author did such a good job at incorporating other yeah. things that I was just like, God, that's exactly what this is. And I super yeah, she it. was really on point with a lot of this. <laughs> like, so Amari um, is so horrified by the, like, this was her best friend essentially because Amari does not have friends. So her slave is her friend. And the fact that it's like compounded a tiny bit by the obvious, uh, fact that she only just now notices which is that her father's having an affair with like his commander of the guard 
I didn't, you know what? I'm, I'm stupid. I didn't realize that that's what was going you on. You didn't? Until she died. No, like I just completely <gasps> blew over my head and I didn't realize it until There's she a died hint from a Mari's like, perspective oh, and then there's a hint from a non's perspective also later. No, I don't know. There are, there are sometimes things that are just right here <laughs> and I don't get it. This was one of those things. It wasn't until she died later that I was like, oh, is he fucking hard? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes, girl, he is. So she anyway. is in a, she's in a place where she's able to like run into his room and grab the scroll that he left unguarded, which doesn't sound likely once we know what it is that he would do that, but okay. And she flees with it and runs into Zelly in the market. And she has this like hood over her head. Zelly has just made like a huge right. Score. Zelly managed to sell that sailfish for five hundred gold pieces, which is like more money than they have ever seen in their lives. And when Amari comes up to her, it is not apparent that she is a a royal at all. Like Zelly can tell she's noble because of the way she stands and speaks, but there is a hood over her head covering her fucking literal crown that she's wearing. And Zelly agrees to help her, and touches the scroll herself and immediately has like this jolt and they have to flee from Lagos. And in the process of fleeing, they almost get caught by Amari's brother, Inan, who is one of the heads of the guard. And he touches it also. Saved by her. And he gets a jolt. And we don't know for sure what it is in that moment, but it is revealed later that he is a Magi and he does not have the white hair but it begins to show up. Yeah. My favorite whole part of this whole thing was her big, like, tiger horse thing. Yes. The rider. <laughs> this fucking thing is huge. Nyla, I think is her name. Or- Nyla. Nyla. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Nyla. That's how the lady in the audio book pronounced it. This is like a giant, like, tiger leopard thing with like horns and it's big enough she describes it very early in the book that she well she describes her brother as being right. huge first of all he's this big hulking thing she's like listen i know these bitches thirst after my brother but i don't really care anything about that it doesn't mean anything to me it doesn't make him special or i'm never gonna do what he says <laughs> anyway but you know she just like acknowledges so we know that he's very big and she describes like nyla as being like up to his was it shoulders or chest, chest think, or something? Yeah. So this is a very enormous lion horse yeah. thing. And it wears a saddle and it's got ears <laughs> and it horns behind its ears and shit. And I'm just like, oh my God. This thing is like jumping through the gates to rescue her and her brother is like riding on it and stuff. And I'm like, Damn, this is so wild shit. I love it. Uh-huh. It was really... It was a big harrowing scene for me. And it's really fucked up, like, in retrospect, because, again, Amari does not understand what she has asked Zelly to do. So she saves Amari, and then it's revealed who Amari is, and Zelly knows, like, she's fucked up. And Tizane is just like, I can't fucking believe that you would... I know you have made some dumb moves, but this is really, like, beyond the pale. And long story short, her brother Inan burns down their village and murders many, many people in an effort to find his sister because he's trying to make his father proud and prove that he can find his sister and fix this all. And we it's get brutal. This, Anon's chapter, mm-hmm. Anon's chapter here was one of my favorites in the whole book um, because I feel like we, we get a lot of sense of he, this guy doesn't get to make a lot of choices on his own. Right. Either. Or at least his dad has been pitting him against his sister their whole life. They have to yeah. fight. And that is, that is heinous. But I feel like in a lot of ways, Inan is actually the counterpoint to Zelly more so than um, Amari, Amara. Sorry. I don't know why I can't get her fucking name right. It's Amari. You were right the first time. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Amari. He he is more of of her counterpoint than his sister is. And I think that's because, you know, Zelly gets to make all of these choices on her own, and a lot of them don't turn out very good at all. Um, but she still gets to make mm-hmm. them. 
and she still winds up getting support for them even when they go badly because she has her brother um who begrudgingly uh sticks around even though he probably feels like maybe he shouldn't yeah. sometimes because she's so dumb but um and non he doesn't get it like he like he agrees to do the stuff that his dad tells him to do but these are not choices no. He doesn't really have any choices. And even though he does some wrong things, bad things, you're making a face. I'm letting you finish. Awful things. Is that better? Well, I'm not Um, entirely in agreement with you that these are not choices, but continue. We'll get to that. Well, finish, finish your first thought. If he doesn't, my, my thought is, I understood where he was coming from because a lot of his choices were based on mm-hmm. fear. You know, he's very, he's not only afraid of his dad, but he's afraid of magic. Right. And magic, to be quite honest, I can understand why people are afraid mm-hmm. of it because Ellie's mother brought Zane back to life. Yeah. She's not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to do that. Like, she, like she wasn't allowed to. I am I wrong? Did I read that scene wrong? Like, this is not something that, like, she was supposed to. She be She used blood magic to do it, which is basically like blood magic. Never been yeah, bad. it's essentially when you use blood magic, you are, you are, uh, taking it to eleven. There's a good chance you yourself will die, and you are. It's almost like you're twisting the arm of the gods. Like you're not supposed to do you're this. You're kind of not, yeah. So, you know that paired with the fact that the king's family was murdered. No wonder people are afraid of this stuff. Like y'all aren't doing very. You're not really representing yourself very well when you're out here bending the rules just so you can bring your son back. How many of other people's kids did you bring back? Probably zero. Uh, I'm not going to side with you on that. I mean, I'm just saying, like. This is terrifying. my my thing is like because you're talking about like it's representing it's your brand, and that's not the concern of uh, like you, you're not. Here. So there should just be allowed to be this like group of people who can bring people back from the dead and see into time and and do all of this like weird stuff completely. That's unchecked. the question. That's terrifying right? because that's what Zelly starts to come to wonder is like. If I got my powers back and I couldn't even completely control them, what about people who have powers that are much more dangerous, like somebody who is a cancer? We see a woman who can literally inflict deadly diseases in an instant. What about somebody like that who can't control their power? And the book never really I mean, answers that question. Killed- it doesn't give us an answer. It leaves us going, I don't know, should we? And that's where Inan yeah. falls, is he sees somebody who is a burner inflict damage beyond belief in a split second and he's suddenly like oh my god okay i don't know about this now because like there's literally no defense against this and that gives that that skews the power so drastically in this other direction that i don't feel like this is right either not only that but he murder he like he kills um the his dad's general right the one that he's he kills her and it's completely on yeah. accident. Now she was probably going to kill mm-hmm. him. She's totally going to yeah. kill him. But uh, this is honestly very frightening. And I feel like the book did not answer these questions. And that was honestly my biggest beef with I it. I actually liked that it didn't answer these questions because I feel like it's yeah. waiting to do that until the next book because of the way it ended. Um, and we're kind of jumping all over the place yeah, here, guys, is- but... I'm sorry. I the just, thrust um, of this is that Amari enlists uh, Zelly into this uh, by accident, and Zelly is her powers are brought back to a degree simply by touching this scroll, and over time and travel to escape from Inan, who is pursuing them now, they come across a um, Chemdomblés which is the old temple where the Magi used to worship their gods. They come across a guard there. And I, I say guard, like a guardian is a better word. Um, a Centero, I think is what they're called in this. Um, and he is 
keeping the temple in secret, kind of, and still has some access to his powers and does this ritual. And it is revealed that Zelly is meant to bring magic back to the Magi in general overall. But she needs a couple of other elements to complete the ritual by the solstice. The other thing... This is where we get into really typical fantasy right. novel stuff. The, the sunstone is the one, and the other thing is the bone dagger, which I don't remember there where was that comes stone from. There was the stone and the scroll. Honestly, like, the, the very middle part of this book, like, everything after they talk to the priest kind of becomes, like, a great big blur A little to me. bit. Um, <clears throat> but that's just because this is a very long book. Mm-hmm. And there were a lot of like little things that happened. Like after this, they, they go to a tournament or something and um, the prize, they need the prize. So they got to compete in the tournament and they got to collect the artifacts to go to the tournament is a very like nice way of, this is a gladiator gladiator battle with unwilling. And I say unwilling participants because these are slaves who are being promised a chest of gold for a victory. That's practically impossible. It's, and it's in an it's desert terrible. and the Colosseum gets flooded to make a sea that they battle on in the middle of the desert. These people are thirsting to death. But here comes all this water that's flooding this Colosseum just for this one thing and then drained out once it's full of bodies and blood at the end of the fucking battle. It's really brutal. It's really unpleasant. And it leads to the it's- coolest thing, which is Zelly fucking creating animations from the many, many spirits of the dead who remain in this Coliseum oh. because she has, she's what they call a reaper. Her power is related to the spirits of the dead, which is the coolest fucking scene. And again, <sighs> this is terrifying. This is why people are afraid mm-hmm. of you, but go on. This, And that's the you thing. Know. That's the question. I get why you're mad it wasn't answered, but again, I kind of like that it wasn't answered because that's a big ass question and you need to give that I, some you know, space. Honestly, I, I do understand it. It's just that this exact question was posed in another show that I was a sequel to a show that I really loved. It was very beloved by me and the sequel like hinged on this, this exact premise. Like, are magic users oppressing other people and is the oppression that's put on them in, you know, in return by non-magic people? Like where do we, like, where's the, the balance Mm -hmm. that there was never, it was never answered and it wasn't answered here either. And it's just really frustrating because this, this is the one thing that I don't think is applicable to real Mm -hmm. life. And this is, I think why I had such a hard time with it. I understand the allegories that she's trying to make. I get it, but the magic thing, this is literally deadly. That's part of what's uh, happening with me in the fifth season as well, that the people who are being brutally, horrifically oppressed can literally end the world and with almost yes, no so effort like- at all. And it's a really tricky, like, you know, what's being done to them is horrifying and wrong, but also what they can do is it the, we're not talking about x-men here this isn't like i can create a flame no. in my hand this is i can crack open the planet to its core it's just and these are yeah so it's a hard question this is not just naked oppression this is not just you're black i hate you i'm gonna make you into a slave because i think you're less than me this is spontaneous combustion at your leisure bringing dead people back to mm-hmm. life and she doesn't answer it. I know there's going to be a sequel, but I don't care. Like, I feel, <laughs> I, just, I don't know, man. I just think that there's this, this is honestly terrifying. And it's just, we're supposed to just blindly follow Zelly and her rage and a thing she doesn't even truly understand. She's not even required to produce all of the necessary things in the end. She doesn't need the incantation. She doesn't need the scroll. She just slices her hands open and grabs the sunstone and talks to her mom. Like, holy, that's super terrifying that she's just able to do this. And we're supposed to be like, go, girl. (laughs) What? This this is so honestly scary. I feel like what what it comes down to is her, like, the quote from Baba 
which is simply they will not respect us until we can fight back. And because she questions whether or not she should even bring magic back. And she questions that kind of openly in front of Inan, who initially is kind of like, well, yeah, you should. And then he starts to like hear what she's saying. And then when he sees the actions of the burner after the festival gets invaded, he's sort of like, oh, my God, never mind. Hard pass on this. Definitely not. I, I found that relatable. Well, and that's because- the thing. And But I do – I find her relatable as well in that they aren't going to just give us equal rights – because we deserve them as human beings. We have to be frightening to them. We have to be able to really hurt them in order to get them to, to not even give us, but because we are going to demand it because we have the power to demand it now. The reason though, that I find that in, in and I, this is really difficult because I really do understand why her inspirations for mm-hmm. this book. I do. But black people in America do not have murder magic. As far as we know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I find it really difficult to buy the argument that you just said. We have to scare them. You were already scaring them. And that's why they oppressed you to begin with. Like you have to, this is not, I understand her inspiration, but this is not. No, I get you. I do. I get what you're saying. I'm just saying. There has to be a connection point where you say, I'm not going to burn you down with my magic and talk to dead people, you know, all the time and maybe bring my son back when I feel like it. Um, but not your son, because I like my son only, and I'm not paying that price for you. But you have, like, there has to be, like, this is not the same as saying, um, you know, we should be nice to white people who should be nice to black people. Like, this is not the same mm-hmm. thing. Like, the magic changes it utterly, and I am very conflicted about it. I think that's fair. I mean, I think that's kind of the point, to be honest, is that Zelly feels like I have to give my people some kind of power. I need them to have any sort of leverage of any kind. But the leverage that she is giving them is so out of proportion that you are kind of like, oh, God, you know, I mean, the the absolute very the havoc that is left in the the tower where she was being kept after Amari and Tizane managed to get his uh, his football buddies together to invade the place. <laughs> I mean, there's piles of corpses covered in disease. There's melted metal walls. There's like, like, you know, dozens and dozens of people dead. And I find it really interesting that, and I'm going to f- f- mispronounce her name, Adeyemi. Um, I'm finding it really interesting that she's not shying away from that. Like, she shows us the That's horror anime. of of it in the eyes of Inan, who while Inan is not like a shining hero, and so you can sort of be like, yeah, but it's Inan saying that. What he's describing is horrific, and it's understandable that he is really unnerved, and it bothers you and makes you uncomfortable to read his perspective and sort of in some ways be like, Oh God, I guess I see your point with that. This is, this is why I say that this is both what I loved about this book and what made me cringe a whole yeah. lot. Because this is bad. You know, this isn't, this isn't just about, um, you know, muggles and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know what else to describe these people. Um, non-magical people um, and, and magic people. There's, there's stuff that happened before this. Like they literally murdered his family, his wife, his other children. Like we can't just look at this and say, well, we need to take back control. Bitch, you had control and you did some murder with it. So now, maybe both of you should. My suspicion is that in the sequel, we're going to get some reveals on why his family was murdered and there's going to be a whole I other thing so. happening there. But. I hope so because right now I'm duly. That's frustrated just that's just a this. guess, but I have a suspicion that there was some shit going on because he tries to say something about how like, well, my father fought for their rights and look what they wound up doing to him, 
And I'm just like, that sounds real easy. Like you were he never gives a real explanation to his kids on why his family was targeted. It's just, oh, suddenly they came after us for apparently no reason. And I feel like that I can't be the story. Right? I suspect that it's probably going to be because a lot about this book is very typical fantasy mm-hmm. stuff. Like I said, this is, and that's fine because that's why I come to fantasy because I know exactly what I'm going to get. But I suspect it's going to be a long history of just back and forth swiping. Maybe. You know, like, you know, magic people abusing their power for corruption and non-magic people creating awful things like this magicite chain stuff that's super gross and terrible. Um, <clears throat> because it's how it always is. And there's it's going to come down to something new, some kind of new accord or whatever, which is really necessary because honestly, I don't really approve of either one of these groups. I would find it interesting <laughs> if his family wasn't supposed to die. If there was something that happened that was like, there was like, well, I won't get into it because this is all complete conjecture. I want something salacious and gross <laughs> is what I want. I want some kind of, of, of like, compromise that went terribly wrong and nobody knows about it except now the king is really mad at killing people that's what i want i want a giant misunderstanding well let's talk about because look so there's that festival scene that we talked about where they get raided and there's the burner who just like burns through three battalions of men in like literal seconds and they aren't burning their ash it's instant like vaporization practically of their body yeah, there's no, there's nothing yeah. left. It's just, they're just gone. Everything, their clothes, um, it's just gone. And this is when Zelly gets captured and tortured. And Inan has to oh, resume geez. his role as prince and pretend that he doesn't care about her. This is horrifying. It is really brutal. And I, what, what happens during this torture? She loses her magic. What do you think that's about? I think it's blood magic. What? They cut her open. They carved a bunch of shit in her back. I think it has to do with, in my opinion, this. it just feels really nebulous. And I think it has something to do with spilling blood and, um, you know, your inner spirit and I'm going to give you a much more practical thing that I thought was happening okay. until the end when it seems like that couldn't have been it. They pour something into her vein. And I thought it was liquid magicite. I thought that they had made some sort of like mixture to suppress her magic Maybe. from inside her body. And see, that makes sense because you have to wonder how they discovered magicite to begin with, which implies a lot of really gross experimentation Mm -hmm. and shit. So my guess is they probably do have like magi that are hidden in the palace somewhere where they do weird stuff Mm -hmm. to them. Um, So that does make a lot of sense. But I don't know. It just felt really spiritual at the end. That's the thing. That's what, like, cause I, I, I was very sure of my theory there because we have a non perspective watching them put this like weird black substance into her vein. But then at the end, when well, she's able okay. to reconnect to her magic, it's not like all of this stuff comes oozing out of her skin or anything is apparently changed physically. Like maybe like it's more, um, all right, so I think it was maybe the teacher who who um, talks about the language that they speak, the magic. Mama Eva? And, yeah, <clears throat> one of the big themes in this book is the disintegration of the, the social unit, um, where you have, like, a language that magi people speak. Um, you know, there's areas that they live in. They have, like, common deities. Mm-hmm. And stuff, and all of this is is really big on the like community. And language brings them together, and cultural practices bring them together. Just like the staff is bringing them together, right. even after they don't you know have all of this stuff. Um, maybe because you know, at the end, um, she's like reaching. She's she thinks she's communing with a goddess, but she's really talking to her mother. And um, she has like these impulses to to bring her brother, and so that they can go and be back with their mm-hmm. parents. Maybe, like, whatever they're putting inside of her, like, 
is not necessarily magicite, but it, it like dulls it on a more spiritual level instead of just this physical, like, hmm. you know, bondage. Hmm. That's me reaching, but um, I don't see why it can't be both. True. You know? Yeah, definitely. Um, There's a lot going on in this book and, and I'm, I, I will definitely be reading this. Sequel. Oh yeah. I Same. thought it was really world building. This woman is amazing at world mm-hmm. building. There were times where I was frustrated with the story and, you know, my unanswered questions and I thought the end was really abrupt, but her world building is, this is good stuff. This is hard yeah. stuff. I want to see her story next. So <laughs> at, what I, when I started this episode and I said, like, I was really impressed with the ending. What I meant was she does not write that love conquers all. And that Inan manages no, to I'm like, blessed. you know, stand up to his father I'm in so the end that- and all of this, which I have to be honest, I fully expected that's where it was going. And I am so glad it didn't. And I feel like it's a really profound sort of met because we want, there are, there are so many stories out there of parents who have these really specific expectations and, and um, biases and, you know, the, their own agendas with their children from birth. And in a lot of these stories, those children grow up and find somebody that does not have those same desires and they throw off the shackles of their parents' expectations by only the power of this person that they have met whom they love. And the truth is parents are a shadow that we will never escape. Whether we believe in what they do or don't believe Throwing off the expectations your parents have of you is so incredibly difficult that it takes years of hundred dollar therapy sessions to do it. This is a fucking business figuring out how to move past things that your parents instilled in you, beliefs and values that they instilled in you. So the idea that anybody can just be like, no, I don't believe it. Forget it. There are certain things that I believe you can. I don't believe this thing that they believe. But as far as changing your entire outlook and behavior, that's a whole other thing. And I'm really glad that she acknowledges that by having Anon in the end do exactly what he has been, like, what has been his main priority for all of his life. You don't get to just shake off wanting to please your father because you met a woman you love. That's not something that just goes away. And Inan doesn't betray them in the way they thought at first. You said you turned your phone off. You motherfucker. That was... Sorry, that's a medication alarm. It's not my fault. Um, no. But yeah, and not like at first they suspect that Inan maybe gave away their location at the festival. And we find out that that is not true. And it gives us a nice little like fake out. Where you for a second, you're like, oh, I don't think Anon did it. And then it's confirmed that he did not. But then he winds up betraying them later in a much worse way. And you're like, wow, okay. So I gave you some credit at first and you're even trashier than we thought. Like, But I love that about him and Zelly. These Neither one of these people are perfect. Right. She is a frustrating hero because she does things with a lot of like emotion. And sometimes you're just like, Hey girl, can you like maybe take a minute, have a seat, have a Snickers, think about it a little bit because you're being real crazy right now. And then, you know, Inan is so oppressed by just so many things. They're just really frustrating. And I think that that's, that's really authentic and, I like that very much um, because I think that really often the the concept of like destiny and what you're meant to be doing. I know that played a small part in here with the seer, but I'm just completely ignoring that because I hate it so much. But, you know, Inan is trying his best to sort out all of this stuff. He's, he's trying to sort through like a childhood of like indoctrination and, 
and, you know, change because his dad raised him in a very specific way because his other family was killed. So he's never really had an opportunity to make his own choices. And he's trying to figure all this stuff out. And he knows that neither side is 100% right. right. You know, both are doing terrible murder. So he has to like, he feels like he's, he's supposed to be king. He's supposed to find the happy medium. And I honestly, I hope that he does, but I definitely didn't care for that romance. You hope that he does. He did. Oh, did he die? Yes. His father killed him. I don't know. I just kind of assumed he lived. That's why. Why did you assume he lived? He gets him through the friggin' heart with his sword. I mean, I read the, I read the end of it really fast. So, I mean, God, yes. Uh-uh. Is going to come back? All right. I'm flipping to the end here to this scene. <laughs> did, you, did I miss that? Um, Let's see. Do, do, do. I can't better than him. I even, I even listened to the audio book. Are you sure he did? I'm pretty positive. Well, I read this book. And I listened to the audio book. So it's in, it's in, on. Really okay, here I'm in his, uh, his POV. It's not what you think. Father jerks back, recoiling like I'm a monster he can't trust. His lips curl back in disgust. Everything in me shrivels. Oh. It doesn't matter. I speak so quickly it all blurs together. I was infected, but it's going away. I did it. I killed magic. Um, and he then sees the crystals in the mercenary's hair that are the same as the ones that they found on Kia's corpse. So her, his father figures out, not only are you you a magi, but you are also the one who killed the woman that I was in love with. Um, he pulls out his okay. sword with a mangle. Oh yeah. My hand, cl- my hands clutch at the sword, but I'm too weak to pull it out. Father, I'm sorry. He pulls out his sword with a mangled scream. I drop to my knees, clutching the gushing wound. Warm blood spills from the cracks between my fingers. Father brings his sword up again, this time for the final blow. There's no love in his eyes, no hint of the pride that flashed just moments ago. Um, I beg for his forgiveness as I pant. My vision blacks out. We've sacrificed too much for it to end this way. I reach out to him with a shaking hand, a hand covered in my own blood. Before I touch him, Father crushes my hand under the heel of his metal boot. His dark eyes narrow. You are no son of mine. So then we go to Amari's POV. And he, he, she says, father steps on his hand and crushes it. You are no son of mine. My voice does not sound like my own as I dash forward. When father spots me, his rage explodes. The gods have cursed me with you children. He spits traitors who stink of my blood. Your blood is the true curse. I snap back. It ends today. Um, so then now I don't know how like I managed to read that as him not. I don't he's not even in the boat at the end. I don't know. I mean he might not be it might just be like he's badly injured and he does make it. But I feel I hope like so. I really liked him. I don't know. I mean he got him right through the, the torso, which I feel like is that's But there's healers. Yeah, I guess that's true. So maybe he's alive. I I don't know. I don't know how I managed to miss that, but I just didn't interpret it as him being dead, even though he's not with them in the very I mean, end. I understand why they wouldn't take him, even if he was alive. <laughs> I mean, it's understandable. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I just hope that the sequel answers my personal questions. Yeah, you know? that's fair. <laughs> yeah so Anand's like final moments of betray and and not only like i want to get here get a little granular here on the level of Anand's betrayal because he doesn't just like turn on zelly even though he's supposed to love her he fucking goes and finds her father who he knows is her weakest spot and uses him as a uh, hostage to force her into turning over the scroll and when her father is like she's assured that handing over the scroll will get her her father back then they murder her father anyway 
This was such a cheap shot. This guy is like, he's suffered. Yeah, so Baba much. has not had a good time. The first time we meet this guy, we learn that he had to watch his wife die in a really terrible yeah. way. They hung all mm-hmm. of them, but they were like chained up as they were being hung. So they were bleeding and suffering from like this magicite stuff on their bodies. But not only that, but they beat the shit yeah. out of him to the point where he doesn't come back to consciousness for Yeah. Days. And when he does, he's so frail. Like, he's just not the man that he was. Yeah. he's. I suspect he has a brain Probably. injury. Just because of some of the choices that he makes. Um, he, he passes out mm-hmm. often. Uh, so that's, you know, I think that he has, I think he has a brain injury, but, uh, he's really frail. Um, and this poor guy just constantly And like fucking Inan is so stupid to be like, I can't believe you killed her. We made this deal and said that why, why Inan do you still think that a deal made with Magi is going to be something that your father gives any shits about they're not people to him you saw the way that he so dispassionately tortured zelly and then like afterwards didn't even remember her name didn't have any sort of like he wasn't shook by it he was out in his room like you know looking through some maps and in a totally good mood later on in the night anon is the zuko of this story and i know you don't know who zuko is because you refuse to watch Avatar the last time. I don't refuse. It's just something that I've been saying I'll cover, so I can't do it. (sighs) Anyway, um, he's the Zuko of this story. He's the victim of, you know, of a very specific type of child abuse. He's been pitted against his sister his entire life, and he doesn't grasp until the very end of, I'm going to put his life in brackets, because we don't really know if he's dead. Um, he doesn't realize the scope of how little his father cares about anything other than Magi suppression mm-hmm. and death. And that takes precedence over him as his son and future. Right. King. And that is such a f- hard pill to mm-hmm. swallow. He do- it, it, he, it's like he's just now realizing that nothing he ever could have done or would have done in even the best of situations was going to please mm-hmm. his father. Period. Yep. Even if he had managed to bring back um, his sister and recover the scroll and all of that. I mean, his dad probably would have made him kill his sister. Oh yeah, most definitely. Like he, he I mean, finally does tell him I, I'm going to need you to take care of her. If you find her at this point, he realizes this this is very difficult for him to overcome as a mm-hmm. person, even when everything is like literally right in front of his face. This is mm-hmm. hard, you know, to, you know, like you said, shaking off your parents' shadow, even when you know that this shadow mm-hmm. is shit. It, this, this is why therapy mm-hmm. exists. It's an industry. Yay, capitalism. But, uh, He's just, he, I think, I really think that he was my favorite character. Yeah, me too, because he's just such a, he's such a mess. And like, you can see that he wants to do right, but he just can't fucking get a hold of what that means. He's like, so, um, the uh, obvious. He, I, this is why I hope he lives. Well, uh, yeah. And I, I, I'm starting to think that maybe you're right because it's not exactly like we don't have the death uh gasps we don't have a scene with amari like cradling his head and saying right, goodbye and- you know like so maybe he is still alive but i just i just feel like his arc deserves a full circle mm-hmm. and without that i feel like it was truncated because he died at his father's hand and yeah he's you know fodder for his sister's arc and as a misandrist i suppose that's <laughs> cool but uh I just, I really fell for this guy. You know, he's trying so hard, but this shit is complex and difficult. And his dad was so awful. Yeah. <laughs> and I really <laughs> liked that moment because, um, you know, we were talking about how much Zelly is like disgusted and frustrated with Amari. 
But then later on, after her torture and they, they carve the word maggot into her back, she talks to Amari about it and is like, you know, I really like had some feelings about the way that you acted like you were so oppressed by your father when you were a noble and you have power and you have luxury and all this stuff. And she's like, but when I was, when he was standing in front of me, I got it. I understood all of a sudden how you were lived in fear of this man just as much as we do for very different reasons, but the fear is still is real, you know, and this is this is what I'm talking about coming together and realizing that oppression exists on all mm-hmm. levels and we're never going to find peace between these non-magical people and the magi if we don't stop trying to set everybody on fire and talk to dead people. Well, spoiler alert, so Zelly does her uh <laughs> her ritual because she's <laughs> sit, sitting there positive this ritual can't work because she doesn't have her magic anymore. And when they kill her father, it's like the location that they're in, they're in the middle of this like center of power, reads his blood as a sacrifice to them. And her magic is suddenly surging through her body, which I found really strange that. I not didn't. Like, what do you mean strange? I mean, strange in um, the narrative that she doesn't choose to sacrifice anything and doesn't understand what's happening well, that's the, here. But that's the thing though. That's, that's what's really kind of terrifying about this is the location read this as a sacrifice because it kind of was. And that happens without Zelly's input. She doesn't choose. That's do my this. problem. This happens regardless. Is that I feel like Why? she should have it gotten to make outside of her. But she doesn't, but that's the nature of like blood magic in general. Like she doesn't get to, she, I didn't have a problem with The it. nature of blood magic is that you choose to do it. You cut your hand and use your blood. Like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's yeah, but how many times does magic. that actually work out though? How many times does that work out? I mean, she does it. The whole point of magic. She does it herself in order to defeat everybody in that Coliseum. And create the animations that she needs. I don't know. I just didn't have a And her brother was scene. brought back and her mother survived. So apparently it works out fairly frequently. Yeah, but you're just, but that's to me, like, that's such a small, like, I just felt like it was such a small scale. But her mother bringing her brother back is, is part of, like, the reason why they're feared as a group. To have this power and just to be able to apply it. I don't it understand why that's relevant to what I'm talking about now, though. With the fact that she doesn't like, Maybe it's not. I'm <laughs> I just because she like in in my opinion in these kinds of stories, the hero is able to fulfill his task by sacrificing something voluntarily because they have realized that this is bigger than them. That they, you know what I mean? That they have like come to this realization that while this is worth something to me personally and I love them or I love this thing, I now have to put myself aside for the sake of everyone who's depending on me. Well, what if the sacrifice was the journey? I mean, okay. I mean, her dad died. Like he had to chase her. Like maybe that was his sacrifice is not telling her to shut up and stay home. (laughs) I mean, I, I mean, I'm just like I'm trying to understand this because I, I was so frustrated with the bow ending and the fact that she was able to do this like super sacred ritual without everything that she actually needed, and it worked out anyway. I'm just trying to understand this magic stuff that we don't really get an explanation okay. on. Well, in the end, as you say, she's able to do this ritual. She taps into like a whole other level of something because apparently the ritual that she was going to do is to bring magic back to the Magi and reconnect them with their gods in order to amplify their magic so that it's beyond what they would even get just touching the scroll. But what she does is like the words for this ritual are totally different than the ones on the scroll. And she is, uh, 
it's sort of like a uh, spoiler alert, Harry Potter and the train station after he allows Voldemort to kill him. She winds up in this, in death. She's dead for an instant and gets to see her mother and Baba and really thinks that it's over and that she gets to be with them now. And it's heartbreaking because she has to come back and she feels like she's like being abandoned by her mother all over again. And it killed me a little bit. That was rough. I, this whole scene made me really impatient. Did it? Why is that? Yeah, It was just really stressful because there was a lot going on. And it was like one of those scenes in the movies where time seems to stretch just long enough for this one thing to happen. Again, this is, I really don't want to keep coming back to this thing because, but I, it really helped me accept the way that the book was laid out. This is such a, this is such an anime thing. I don't understand what you mean. Like time stretched long enough for this to happen. What do you mean by that? Well, like, uh, for example, if you have like a countdown, like this volcano is going to explode in 10 minutes, we're on a countdown. And yet the hero has enough time to, you know, attempt to summon, you know, a spirit or whatever. And inside of the spirit is like a guru that they had that died. And they have a really long conversation about, you know, what they're supposed to do and what sacrifice means and what magic means inside of you and all of this stuff. And it takes way longer than it's supposed to. But it's like plot convenience. You get to have this moment with your parents. and But there's no it, countdown it lasts happening longer. here. I don't know. For me personally, it just felt really stressful. Okay. You know, like, is she going to do it or is she not going to do it? You know, and I knew that, like, she probably would. But it just, it was just, um, it was such a tense moment for me personally. Okay. Um, yeah, because I just assume, like, you know, I get what you're saying in, in that kind of situation. But she's like in a whole other plane of existence here. So time is not going to be passing at the same rate, I would assume. Right? Oh, yeah, but like what's happening where her body is, you know, like what's going on. She elsewhere? dead. Are people That's dying? Going on with her body. You know, is she, yeah, but she was never going to stay dead. No, but she really wanted to, which was the part that I felt a little bad about. Well, she only wanted to because she's been struggling. So yeah, and that's the thing. <laughs> Which is under... Like, Harry Potter, he sort of is like, so do I go back? And he's given a choice, really. Dumbledore's like, you can. You can he, You can take get on that train there. And Harry's like, well, where will it go? And he just says, on. I hated that scene in Harry Potter. Though, I didn't. So. I didn't love it, but I'm just using it as an easy comparison here. Um, and she isn't given a choice. She's straight up told, "Oh no, no, no! You're not supposed to be here yet." So, uh, you go on back, and she's just like really torn up because she clearly would have chosen to stay if she had been given a choice. And even so, even though Harry is given one, you can see that he isn't ready to leave. You can feel that from the moment that scene begins. But with her, the fact that she would have gone is just endlessly heartbreaking to me. Like she has just been through such hell and has been broken in so many ways. And the fact that they force her back out into this world, I'm just like, that fucking blows, man. This is just like, she doesn't get a damn break, you know? This is a, this is, probably the only time that I was reading this book besides the seer thing that I'm still ignoring the only time where I felt like destiny was being forced on a character. Mm, okay. She wanted to mm -hmm. die. Like her choice would have been to die and stay with yeah. her mother. She even thinks about her brother and how they are, you know, they can, be together again and be a family mm -hmm. and stuff. This that was that would have been her choice, and while that would have been a very bad choice for the plot, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> for the sake of the plot, like, listen, you're in a book, you can't choose yeah. that. There, listen, lady, I want a sequel. I just I'm just like imagining the author arguing with her main character. No, <laughs> I'm supposed to write a sequel. <laughs> Get back in line. 
you're ruining my advance right now. You can't die. I got an advance from my publisher to write two more books about you. So you're going to suck it up. Right. And do it. But it just like, this was the one time where she wanted to make a choice for herself and as selfish as it was, it was just really stressful that she didn't. Yeah, I agree. That. So she wakes up and she's on the deck of a ship and Amari is there and she asks, did, did we do it? Is magic back? And Sane is there. I think it's to say, yeah, he stills his silence sinks my heart in my chest after all that, after Inan, after Baba, it didn't work. I force out, but Amari shakes her head. She holds up a bleeding hand and in the darkness, it swirls with vibrant blue light. A white streak crackles like lightning in her black hair. For a moment, I don't know what to make of the sight. Then my blood chills to ice. End of book. What? She brought back magic for everybody? Candace, I have to be honest with you right now. I do not know how you can have this question about, well, if they are able to do stuff everybody else can't do, then why do we want magic back? And then when she brings it back to everybody, that's your reaction. Because I feel like that's answering the damn question you had in a way, which is okay. to be like, well, what does it look like if everybody has it then? Okay, well, if it, everybody has it, that you know, that's not even the same discussion. But what does she mean by everybody? Because it's always it's always been implied that that you know only magi had the magic, and even if the hair assumption and the physical attributes were incorrect, um, that still doesn't mean that anybody can have it. That's never been implied even once. So how do you think Amari has it? Because she was just in the temple when it happened. Well, her brother had it too. Like this is what I'm saying about like I hope we get more history, because like we don't know where his kids came from. You know we don't. You know we don't know like. She even says earlier in the book that um, I forget the name of the 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 race that they're the the race is probably the wrong word, but the the people that they're not supposed to like have relationships with. It starts with a C. I don't remember. I'm not sure. Uh, there's another group of people, um, and they're not supposed to mingle. They're not supposed to kiss. They're not supposed to date. They're not supposed to marry. They're not supposed to shag. They're not supposed to do any okay. of that stuff uh, because. But they they started um, early, you know, like before the story or whatever. Okay. Like she mentions that they started having kids and they started mingling and, uh, you know, <clears throat> whatever. So, but we never really, it's always implied that the Magi, they're the ones that have the magic. So unless there's some kind of historical thing that happened that we don't know about, which I'm seriously hoping she goes into in the next book, there's, when you say everybody, it doesn't really mean everybody. It just means whoever had a kid with a magi, maybe. And that's like, and that's making me wonder if maybe the king is wrong that his family was murdered by magi. How does he know that? Like, maybe you. it was one There's of his own family something. members, or maybe it was like, Let's so see. somebody had a magi mistress. I feel like it's more than that. I feel like it's about like a bunch of people having this potential in them and not knowing it. And they were experimenting. It has to do with the mixing though. Yeah, I think so. Like there, there has to be something going on. And in my opinion, it has to do with, like you said, experimentation and inter, this is a gross word, but I really don't have another one at this moment, but interbreeding. Inter you know, like how they used to do with like the Scottish people where they would, you know, they would have like British lords or whatever. They would come in and they would fuck all the brides on the wedding yeah, night. Yeah, prima in nocta. Hopes that she would get knocked. Yeah, that's mm. so gross. Like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel like that's completely out of the out of the realm of possibility here. Um, yeah, I'm just like so. Anyway, I stand by it that your your question is about well. Do we really want them to have magic if they have this kind of power that nobody else has? And it's such an uneven playing field. But it seems like she's looking at, at even that out a little bit more. And that's what's going on. Either everybody should have it or nobody should have it. And if she's going to put everybody should have it, then that's fine. I'll read that book too. She's taking black girl magic to a whole other level here, actually. I'm just realizing. Girl, that is, that is. <laughs> 
I've never even thought of that. Good for you. Um, so yeah, so that's the end. And it's just really leaves this like huge door wide open that I'm very curious about. So I'm looking forward to that fucking sequel. I don't know when that's coming, but I got my eyes peeled for it and I'll probably cover it for the book. As club. much as the, I think mean, that sounds great. As much as some of the middle parts, I feel like reminded me heavily of like the middle book of Lord of the Rings, like the yeah. two towers where it's just like, Oh my God, how long do you have to be in the swamp for fuck's sake? Can you please just go? As much as the middle of the book felt a little bit like that to me in some places, the beginning dragged me in a lot more than I expected it to. And the end made me angry, which I suppose. It made you feel something. I suppose. Yeah, but you're talking about it. It made me feel something. (laughs) (laughs) It made me feel something, so. You know, I liked it. I thought it was good. Um, yeah. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope you uh, enjoyed our coverage. Y'all know where to find us. Facebook.com slash Unspoiled Pod. Twitter at Unspoiled Show. Instagram at Unspoiled Podcast. Um, the next book I'm going to be covering next weekend is going to be the um, the Little House in the Big Woods, which is a childhood favorite, problematic childhood favorite. I'm excited about it. Is that a Laura Ingalls Wilder mm-hmm. book? Ooh, yeah, m- they were some of my very, very favorites growing <laughs> up. Um, oh, I love yeah. them too. But looking back, it's like there's going to be a plenty well. to unpack. <laughs> um, so that's going to be the that's the February uh, childhood favorite, and then the March book is Crazy Rich Asians, and the March childhood favorite is Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, which I'm super excited about. I can't about. wait to hear your thoughts on crazy. Movies. Yeah, I have uh, I have no idea what, what I'm getting into here other than it's like a uh, fish out of water scenario. And that's as much as I really I've know. already read it. So um, I've already read it. I'm going to listen to the audio book again. I can't wait. So yeah, guys, you should uh, tune in for Laura Ingalls Wilder, which I will be host co-hosting with a guest Gina. So yeah. Um, so I'll see you on uh, next Saturday for that. Thank you, Candace for rescheduling Thank me you for having a bunch me. of times. I was sick. It's, it's my fault. I got really, I had bronchitis last it's the week, worst. Guys. This season has been so brutal. And Everybody's just, my kids brought it home to me. Those little twerps, beautiful things that I created with my own body. <laughs> She said cautiously. <laughs> I made them from scratch and I just want to send them back, but you can't do that. Um, all right, guys. Well, thank you again so much. And I will see you in a week with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.